Welcome to this YouTube channel. We are Bibleway Temple International, an apostolic church situated in the Mova Lavantil community, located in the beautiful Twin Island Republic state of Trinidad and Tobago. Our mandate is to touch and transform lives by being good stewards, sharing the message of Jesus Christ. And today, it is a pleasure to share this message with you. We invite you to praise and worship with us as we proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord over our lives. And thank you, Dr. Paul. As you correctly, I was supposed to have gone home to Toronto, but I came on a one-way ticket. And I did not realize that there are no tickets available now. You know, after the, 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 the COVID sequestering and incarceration and imprisonment, it seems as though a lot of people are excited about flying. So I'm stuck in Trinidad at least until the weekend. And I'm so blessed to be with you this morning. Let's just look at some realistic things. Jesus Christ never made a claim, Dr. Paul, to any supernatural endowment or capacity without performing a miracle to validate and vindicate his authority. He said that I am the bread of life and fed a crowd of 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Come on. Now he says to you and me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he just fulfilled every dimension of that word that was spoken. Now he has declared that I am the resurrection. Come on. And he went to the grave and came back victoriously this morning with the keys of hell, death, and the grave on his girdle of truth. And we are joint heirs with him. Hey, we are joint heirs with Christ. Now, if we are joint heirs, could, could you just stand with me, doctor? We are joint heirs to this, to this telephone, okay? We are joint heirs. What does it mean from a legal point of view? We have got an equal share. Well, could you imagine that Jesus, we got an equal share with Christ. He opened blind eyes. He healed the sick. He walked on water. He raised the dead. Come on, understand me. He fulfilled every dimension and promise of the word of God. We are joint heirs. Come on. We've got an equal share. But it seems as though the resurrected life is something that has really, uh, you know, we have avoided the immensity of what is contained in that promise. So he never made a, an attestation to a, a gift or anything without performing a miracle to validate and to vindicate his greatness. Now, there was a, there's a problem, Pastor. If Jesus said repeatedly that I'm going to go to the grave and in three days I'm going to rise again, why did his disciples embalm him? Come on. Why did they embalm him? Wasn't that a lack of faith? Or, or maybe even spiritual understanding? Or, or maybe they had succumbed to the fear of the Roman soul. Now hear what I'm telling you, friends. Whatever you fear, you empower. Whatever you fear, you empower. Come on, just lift your hands to God. You know, tell you. There's a, you know, there's been so much fear about COVID. I see a very astute man with us this morning. Could you stand, please? It's Professor Francis. Could you stand, please, and just let's acknowledge this great man of God and his, and his lovely wife, Valerie. It's a pleasure to have you. And we have another minister, Valerie, there with us. It's a pleasure to have you, Valerie. Would you, st uh, 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 Wendy, would you stand, please? Uh, and I see another uh, tremendous friend of mine. She's one of my students in Toronto. Her, her name is Janelle Polaya. Come on. She is working towards her master's degree in counseling. It's so nice to have you guys here. Terry's there. Could you stand? He's one of my spiritual sons from Toronto. Uh, and we have got Minister Steve here, and we have got Kato back there. So we got a good, 
representation from south, okay? Amen. We are people from the south. So, so let, 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 let me just say, so won't you say that that, that was a restriction on their faith? Why bam him? I'm coming back in three days. Dissolve this temple and in three days it's going to rise again. When, 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 when Noah, uh, in, in fact, Jonah, he declared that it's a sign. My life is a sign. My journey is going to be a sign. A validation that contains an inscripted revelation. He says, I'm going to go into the belly of the whale for three days. And so would it be with Jesus Christ. In three days, I'm going to be like Jonah. Now, Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Let's look at the revelation that is contained here, Pastor, because a lot of people don't see it. Check this out. Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Now, it has been stated that the pungency and the acidity of a whale's stomach is so acidic that it could make holes in two-inch steel plates. Think about it. What equates with Jesus when he says, I would go into the, hear what I'm telling you, church, just like Jonah. He was declaring that he had gone into the lowest hell. He went into the lowest, filthiest humanity. And there he preached. He preached salvation to those who never heard the message, including a lot of the patriarchs in the Bible. So he's tumbling down through the pages of time. Let's, let's look at some scriptures this morning before I get into my little sermon. Let's check some stuff out, my dear friends. Here is Jesus. You see, there were miracles that he had performed in his lifetime. There were miracles that was performed. You know, there is a Sadducean mentality that does not believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in anything, you know, immaterial. They don't even believe in the angelic realm. But hear this. When the wise men came looking for Jesus, they told the wise men, there is Jesus. There are people that's going to point you and me to heaven, but they themselves would not make it. They pointed to where Jesus was when he was born, but they never went in themselves. So let's look at some stuff that took place in the Bible. The, you know, the, you remember the days of Elijah? And Elisha, when that dead baby was brought to him, he laid on the baby and the baby came back to life. Remember when the bones of a soldier was thrown into a tomb where Elisha's bones was and that dead man got up and ran? Remember when Jesus went to the house of Jairus? Come on. When he went to the widow's house, he says, You are asleep, daughter. Come back to life, son. Come on. What was Jesus doing? He was validating and vindicating that there was a coming day of a glorious moment. That's going to enshrine the church with resurrection power and anointing. Aren't you blessed that this day has come? Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise again. Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Come on. This is stuff that he is saying to the church. Come on. He is not here, but he is risen. Come on. I would raise up on that day. The brother should rise again. He that was dead came forth. John 11. He showed himself alive after the passion. Acts 1 and 3. What is he doing? Because there is still a lot of argument that Jesus never came back from the grave. I'm a theologian in the city of Toronto. I'm a professor. So I hear all of these arguments. Could I tell you that Jesus was seen by at least 500 people when he came back from the grave? So you can't contend he is the only God that is alive. We don't serve Muhammad. We don't serve Krishna. We don't see Buddha who was eaten by worms and burnt with fire. Come on. We serve a God who is alive. So somehow in the process, we have got to realize 
that we have got to live in a dimension of the resurrected power of Christ. You've got to say to yourself at all times, you know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God would lift up a standard and the gates of hell would not prevail against me. Come on. You've got to tell yourself, uh, no weapon formed against me should prosper. I am the head and not the tail. God has called me to fly and not fall. I am here to float and not sink. Come on. And that is maintaining a consciousness of living in a resurrected mentality. I could come back from everything and anything that the devil throws my way. We have got that mentality that circumvents in the very arena of our thinking. Has the church lost something? Hey, brother, where's the brother organist, man? Are you, where's the keyboard, man? Go ahead, bro. Play for me, man. You have a synthesizer, a mode on the... You have an electric piano? Just, just play softly. Is that okay? Come on, this man is all for trouble, man. He's dressed in red. Red mask, red shirt. Come on. He's a bloody man. Hey, I really enjoyed your song, Leading Daughter. How many of you enjoy that song, Leader? Come on, look at that. I love that lady, man. I love what she does. She becomes one with what she's doing. And sometimes, daughter, you really cannot declare something until you feel it. I've said to young ministers, you cannot declare a word until you feel it. Until you become one with the scripture and enter into the actual situation. Hear what I'm telling you? You become more effective and you've got more relativity. Come on. When you sing a song like my sister, you've got to feel it. You know, my, 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 my dear friend, and I was going to sing a song this morning, but the, the, the technical stuff is not coming on. My very close friend is C.C. Winans. And, you know, could you imagine, remember when we were singers in the days of PTL with Jim and Tammy Baker? You know what I mean? I would say that there are people around us, Mike Murdoch and Paul Anka and Benny Hinn and all these guys were still young fries, man. Today they're big people. But we used to sit and talk, oh, how could we be more effective when we minister? And an old woman from Charlotte, North Carolina, sat with us one night. And this is what she says. You've got to become one with what you are declaring. Come on. You cannot declare it until you could feel it. And you have got to leave the scriptures and become one with an actual situation so that when you release it, can I tell you something, my dear friends? Come on. You are going to be more effective in your discourse. Is that okay to say, man? So we are talking about the resurrection. So he did things to validate and to vindicate his greatness. You know, I met with a woman on Thursday night. I preached at the church of that Dr. Kelvin Corbett. And, and this woman has lost her two breasts to cancer. And they took out her midsection. And she came to me with her husband. She said, Dr. Carmody, could I have a child or two? For a moment, there was a lady sitting here. She looked just like her. She said, daughter, if you understand the resurrected power that God has left the church, you can do anything. Come on, somebody say amen. I says, God could put your midsection back in place. Come on. And you're going to bear your husband a couple of babies. And when they reach the age of 7 and 12, they would be preaching the gospel. Come on. Understand me. I said, because you are living now in a resurrection mentality. And I wish that the church could understand this. We would be fearless and invincible. It's the cultivation of a mentality. Jesus came back from the grave. What does, it, what does it really mean? What does it represent? Yes, he has powers over death. But let's look at some of the other intangibles. I believe that you and me could come back from anything and everything. 
Death had no hold on him. You were joint heir with him, sister. Come on, we are joint heirs with him. Dr. Paul, we have got an equal share of the power, the authority, the sovereignty, and the preeminence of God. But is it being reflected? Come on, has Christianity really given up on what we possess? You know, I looked at COVID. Man, and I must tell you, it got me in the last <laughs> six weeks ago, I was flat in bed with COVID for the first time. You know, and the doctor says, hey, David, you got, I got some major heart surgery not too long ago, man, five bypass. And, and, and the doctor, hey, David, you're in danger, man. We can't really help you if things go south. He says, well, doc, I believe in God. Yeah. Come on, I believe in God. Yeah. Come on, say, I believe in God, you know. And uh, I said, boy, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. But if he had punched in his YouTube or something that follows me, I tell you, he'd be upset, man. But can I tell you something? When you understand the power that has been given to you and promised to you and me, my friends, we would live fearlessly. You see, check this out. Look at Jesus. He went to the grave. Now, I consider his prayers at Gethsemane to be the most important prayers that was ever uttered by him. Because it was at Gethsemane that his sweat became blood. And he really submitted to the divine will of God. I'll tell you why. Remember, there was an instance where he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass me by. What was in that cup? The sins of the world. He saw the LGBT people having more rights than normal people. He saw a cancer culture. He saw an erosion and embellishment of biblical morality. He saw Finland calling Christianity an enemy of the people. Come on. He saw uh, things where statues that was uh, sacred to your grandmama and mine were torn down and ravaged by the world. Come on. He saw the world being given the rights of the church. Come on. He saw Kamala and Biden fixing to legalize prostitution at the age of 12. Come on. So when he looked at that cup that contained the sins, he saw Adolf Hitler. He saw Bashar. He saw Saddam Hussein. Come on. He saw all of these characters through history. He looked at that thing and he saw Adolf Hitler. Hear what I'm telling you? And the human side of him says, if it be possible, let it pass me by. You know, he was man and God. I want to show you, my dear friends, if it be possible, God, I can't take this. It, it, it's too much. How many of you have sometimes you got to bear things that are looked like too much? Lift your hands to God. Like that husband, you worked two jobs, you put him through school, and when he graduated, he took off with another lady. Come on. Your kids are 13, 14 year old, and they're cursing you and rebelling against you. They have joined gangs. Come on, you send them to school and they are somewhere else. Come on, I'm telling you, there is such an erosion. There's no respect for parents no more. Kids today have got more rights than parents. You know, kids are divorcing their parents legally. You can't touch a child no more. Man, them, 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 them social workers in them schools in Toronto, they lock you up, especially if you're a Christian parent. You know, in my city where I live in Toronto, if you've got two, daughter, two, two daughters, and, and you say, look it, I want to have one son and one daughter. You could take one of them daughters, and this is what they say, surgically reassigned or gender customized and turn it to a little boy. Government pays for it. If you are a school teacher and a little boy tells you he wants to become a girl, you dare not tell him otherwise. Conversion therapy, 
This is the world in which we live. Let me ask you a question. Martin Luther King, a man who had faced hostility all of his life. Check this out. If you ask them, how did you live amongst the Ku Klux Klan who had one thing they wanted to kill you and destroy your vision? Come on. And leave the black man in the ghetto. Hear what? How did you survive the animosity? Do you know what he said, Bishop? Martin Luther King says, you know what? I never looked at what was taking place around me. My view was in eternity. I looked towards the resurrected life. And that was the mechanism of propulsion that kept me burning. Come on. That was the fuel that ignited in my soul. Now, there is a little lesson. He lived in view of eternity. Come on. He grasped the intensity of the resurrected life. And everything that could have affected him in the natural and in the normal, he had the ability to rise above it. So here is Jesus. You and I know what he suffered. He won the war at Gethsemane. If it be possible, let this cup pass me by. Say with me the human will. But the second time around, he prayed, Not my will, but thine. Say the divine will. Come on, say with me the divine will. The divine will superseded the human will and that is the prayer that won the victory for the church. Now we see him on Calvary's cross. He sliced up, he's butchered. There is cuttings and bleedings from all over his body. The Bible says that he was put on a post like this, Pastor, and there was a whip that was thrown around him. And at the end of that whip, there were fish hooks, nine fish, nine tributaries with fish hooks at the end. And when it was wrapped around him and pulled, there were heaps of his flesh at the foot of the cross. Come on, understand me. They took a three-inch Lebanese thorn and rammed it into his skull. Hear what I'm saying? The Bible says he did not look like a man no more. He looked like a monster because they rammed the tree trunk into his jaw and with the oozing of blood, come on, that was coming from his scars and his face not looking human. Could you imagine how horrible it was? Hear what? And when he cried out, I thirst, I thirst. How many of you know that was not meant to be something difficult? That narcotic was was contained in the sponge was vinegar and it was to deaden the pain. But this is what he says. I don't want to deaden the pain. I want to birth my church. I want to bear my church. Come on. She is my bride and I am going to take whatever it takes uh, to birth the church of the day. I spoke at the Canada Christian Center, Trinidad Christian Center on Friday night. It's a big church up in that Pity Valley. And I spoke about an aspect of the cross. Now remember, Pastor, how many of you know loneliness is not a good thing? It's the first negative thing that God spoke of in the Bible. It is not good for man to be alone. How many of you have suffered from loneliness from time to time? Raise your hands to God. You're not alone, but you're lonely. How many of you know what I'm saying? You've yoked yourself or married yourself to the wrong person. There's no spiritual equilibrium. There's no social equality. You hear what I'm telling you, church? You know, you're in that place. Hear what? You're not alone, but you're lonely. Jesus put him to sleep and he took out a rib from his side and he made him a wife. Now this wife, if Jesus was, if Adam was the first type of Christ, who was Eve? A first type of the church. But here is Jesus. I want to show you the fulfillment. Jesus is on the cross. He has suffered everything that the world could throw at him. 
there was an aspect where his clothing, you know, he wore a seamless robe. And the Bible says his clothing and his body became one. What it meant is that his clothing was so soaked with blood that it was baked onto his skin. And the Roman soldiers came and they pulled it off his body. Could you imagine the blood, the skin, and the tissues? Everything came out with that robe. And they just uh, used it for casting lots and gambling. Now check this out. He has gone through all of these indignities. But now, he's on the cross. Remember where God, where did God take Eve from? Side. Jesus is on the cross. And there runs up a soldier with a spear. And rams it where? And what came out? It is called hematriadosis. It's not supposed to happen. The only time blood and water comes out of someone is if they had died a long time or they might have suffered deep emotional trauma and turmoil. But let me just conclude what I want to say. When the blood and water came out of his side, what did it represent? Come on, the blood and the water. The water of the regeneration of the world. The blood that cleanses us. It represented the bursting of the New Testament church. Come on. It failed the first time. But this time, he is declaring that I took it all to the cross. And I nailed it so my church could soar victoriously. He has gone through everything. Yes, his body was in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, but where was his soul and spirit? His body was there, but where was his spirit? He went to the lowest hell to preach salvation to those who never heard the message. To the pedophiles, the murderers. Come on, understand me. The drug dealers, the genocidal leaders. Come on, the putrid Sanhedrin, the caustic Pharisees. Come on, the doubting Sadducees. He had gone there to preach to them that hear what I'm telling you. There is a way to eternal life. Come on, and it's not going to come through your works. It's not going to come through your efforts, but your faith has got to be in the shed blood of Jesus Christ it is the only mechanism that's going to bring you to heaven but now he must be taken to the cross by necessity you see you and I was born to live but he was born to die can I tell you this? When God declares, sister song leader, God says that even before the foundations of the world, the Lamb of God was slain. Pastor, even before the foundations of the world, there was a death sentence on him. How many of you like to live that kind of way? You ain't born as yet, but there is already your life has been designated to die. A horrible death. You mean telling me that every time God looked at him, he knew that one day he was about to die? When they formed the axis of the air and the falls of the, come on, understand me. And they put creation in motion. Hear what I'm telling you. God looked at his son. The Bible says, let us make man. In the book of Genesis, let us make man. Who is the us? The father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on, understand me. So whenever Jesus was in company with God, God would look at him and just turn his face away. Because there is coming a day he's going to be butchered. He's going to be He's going to be sliced up. 
He's going to be mutilated. He is going to be disfigured. And it's going to be so horrendous and despicable that at three o'clock in the day, I would have to turn my face away and send darkness to the world so I would not witness the atrocity that is being poured out against my son. You know why he died, my dear friends? He died for you and for me. Come on. And he died to give us a power to live right. By necessity, he must die. In the process, he was validating that I birthed the church again. Amen. And if this church does what Eve did, we're going to have the same results. You remember Eve? She communicated with the serpent. If this church goes along with the kind of foolishness, not here, I love Pastor Paul. He's a man that is centered on the word of God. Come on. I tell you, I love the fact that he's word-based. Come on, give your pastor an applause. You don't get no foolishness from Curtis Paul. You don't get no double standards or ambivalent doctrinal positions. Come on, he centers himself and his church on the word of God. So now he must go. He must die. And this is a process that was pre-designed by the fingerprint of God even before the world was formed. Amen. Pastor? He must be crucified. Three days later, he must rise again. If not for his resurrection, we should close up the church and go sell doubles. If there is no reward at the end of this sacrificial life. Come on, think about it. If there is no reward, Paul declares, my faith is in vain. I know men and women who lived in countries and sacrificed their entire lives. For the gospel of, not the rich kind of dudes we have in this country. You might hear me get, get on the radio and get on bad, okay? How many of you hear me get on bad on the radio? Can I tell you why? Because the churches in our country is too complacent. We are running a race but crossing the wrong finish line. We don't have a clue or a concept and everybody speaks about precept when we lack a concept of the way church is supposed to be. You know, we would never understand why God wants us, brother. There is a trichotomy. There is an outer court. In the outer court, you praise God. You don't even have to be saved to praise God. Let everything that had breath praise me. But when you come into the inner court... You would worship him. And that is where you need a relationship of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And the outer court dude would never understand what the inner court man is experiencing. But it does not end there, Pastor Curtis. There is a place called the Holy of Holies. What takes place in the Holy of Holies? When you are in the glory of God, come on. And you have come to a place in your life where everything is mortified. And you are dead to this world. And you could sacrifice unto God. Today you tell the church to come out for one week of prayer meeting. Everybody gets mad at you. You try to enforce any form of discipline. They said you're a legalist. Come on. That's where the church... Everybody got rights. And the rights of God are diminishing. You see this COVID? People have become so desensitized about their Christianity. They feel they could stay home and watch you on the YouTube. No, my dear friends, there is something about the collective power of coming to a church. Come on. One would put a thousand to feet. Two would put ten thousand to feet. Three would put a million people. Think about the mathematical probability of how many demons the church would run in a morning like this where you got a church with about a hundred people. Come on. We have got such mathematical powerful strength. Can I tell you something, my dear friends? That mentality has to go. You know, I had an altar call on, 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 on Trinidad Christian Center. 
And at the end of the, the, the night, the pastor called me home. He says, David, I know my people. Everyone that came to the altar that night had run coal on God during the COVID. Come on, just a few hands to God. I pray that you warm up again, okay? You know, brothers, sisters, I, I, I pray that, that, that God is going to light a fire on the altars of your heart once again. And you would serve God with fire and with passion. Come on. With fire and passion. Now, I was told I would never preach a message again. The doctor said, hey, man, you're a dead man. You got five bypass. Behave yourself. You can't travel. You can't fly. You can't sing a song again. Come on. That's what the doctor said. That's not what the great physician, come on, somebody say amen. Come on, understand me, my dear friends. Understanding the resurrected dimension. It would invest in you with a haze of brilliance. There is going to be a divine enablement that you are going to obtain and receive. And that's not all. It's going to release creative energies and anointings into your womb. But you've got to understand this. Could I tell you something? The womb of God, that is the church. The womb does not produce life. It fertilizes and germinates the life that's put into it. All them sisters sitting here, think about it, they all got wombs. But pastor, they ain't just going to bring forth life. A seed has got to be planted into it. And that is the incorruptible seed of God's word. Hear what? So if the womb of God is the church, the Holy Spirit is the birthing agent. You're going to push out what God has put in you. An intercession is not a prayer, it's a work. Praise and worship. Spirit and truth. What happens when you come here? Come on, do your hand like this. Come on, do your hand like this. Bring down the glory of God. Come on. Bring down the glory of God. How many of you want the glory of God? I want a better experience today than I had yesterday. Come on. Bring down the glory of God. Your sicknesses will be healed. Your finances will be repaired. Your jobs will be saved. Your children will quit rebelling. God is going to fix your marriage. Bring down the glory of God. And how much we need to enter into that third trichotomy. Of Christianity. But in the outer court we are saved. On the inner court we are filled. But what happens when we come to the Holy of Holies? We are mortified in the flesh and dead to sin no more. On the outer court you got a church consciousness. On the inner court you got a word consciousness. But when you come into the Holy of Holies you got a God consciousness. Come on. You become one with God. When you preach this kind of way in them big churches, they get mad. Said, hey, 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 that's too fundamental. My people got things to do. They got to go and look at soccer warriors get beat up in football. Or what's the other cricket team name? Knight Riders. Very good second place team. How many of you God wants some sacrifices? If Jesus could have gone to the cross and allowed himself to die, come back for you and me. Come on, somebody, somebody appreciate that, please. Even God says, I can't look at what they're doing. The sun went dead at 2 o'clock in the day. It went dark. I'm not going to take much longer. Are you enjoying this little session this morning? Give the Lord a clap offering then. And as, as I said to you, I love the song leader because she was number one with what she was doing. But 
me just read this to you. And this is Jesus. That's okay, brother. I'm okay with this. Yeah, well, that's okay. I can still use it. Thank you, man. Bless you, man. And this is from the book of John, the 20th chapter. Jesus has been in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea for three days. And Mary Magdalene. You see, there is something about people and the way they worship God. Mary Magdalene had seven demons and layers of prostitution in her genes. But she had met Jesus. And he did a great work in her life. It seems as though the more cruel a person was before they got saved. They worship God with a deeper fervency when they get saved. But I know some murderers and so on where I come from in my block. And when them guys got saved, there was a guy that Kato and I, we were laughing and talking about him recently. He was into prostitution. He was into everything. He would sell his daughters, man. He was into making counterfeit money. He went to jail for a long time, but he came back out saved. Come on. And that man became a preacher. The baddest dude in Duncan Village became a preacher. And he lived a life that was so devoted and consecrated and sacrificial. Come on. All of the people who barely did anything wrong could not reach his depth of service. You know what I'm telling you? If God forgives a man for $50 and if he gives another for $5,000, who's going to love him more? The parable of the pounds. Who's going to love him more? The bigger debt, won't it? How did I get on Taylor, man? So the, she's now looking. She came at the tomb. And Jesus was not there. She thought to herself that his body was stolen. Or they might have fed it to dogs. That's what the Romans did. And she began to weep. You see, because he had done a great work in her life. She loved him dearly, implicitly, and unconditionally. There was nothing too difficult that she would not, you know. And she did something in her life. You know, Pastor, you know when the Bible says in the house of Simon the leper, there was an unidentified woman that came in with a box of alabaster and broke that box and anointed him. Who was that woman? This was the woman. Come on, somebody say amen. And you got to know that that alabaster box that she carried. Let me, let me poor sister. I won't steal your money, okay? This was the alabaster box. And you know what it represented? This woman was a prostitute. In a, in a hardened uh, Jewish community and society under the Levitical priesthood and the law, no man would marry her. She could not have walked the streets alone. She was put into designated areas. She could not have gone to the temple. She could not have had access to her young nieces and nephews. But brother... She found a man who loved her. And she found a man who respected her. And this was the alabaster box. You know, CC sang that beautiful song, the alabaster box. And you know what she was doing, sister? Well, she was taking this to his family as a dowry for his hand in marriage. Can you imagine? This was going to be her dowry. And that man and that marriage would have restored social status, would have bought her respect. She thought about going down to the placid seas of the Galilean Ocean and swimming and going up to Mount Jerusalem at night and have coffee and cake. But when she heard that Jesus was in the house, come on, she gave up everything earthly that she had and she took the alabaster and she broke the box and supernaturally anointed him for burial. You know, hear what I'm saying? The point is, how many of us would give up everything natural in order to praise him? It was an expensive praise. 
She gave away her marriage. She gave away her future. She gave away her social status and a handsome dude to make her warm at night. In preference, honoring the Lord. You know, she was there in the book of John, the 20th chapter. But Mary stood, verses 11, John's 20 and 11, outside of the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into that place. And she saw two angels in white that were sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been laid. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where he is or where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing in the corner. I want you to leave the pages. Let's just get away from the Bible for a moment, the words. She is out there looking for Jesus who has done a great work in her life. That she loves and she honors him with every atom of a human mortality. And now she knew that he had faced and experienced a horrible slicing and butchering just three days ago. And she comes now to look for his remains. But as she enters, he's not there. And there is an angel at his head and an angel at his feet. And the angels will ask the question, well, why are you weeping? And she says, well, they took my Jesus away. Just look at this, my dear friends. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back. And she was about to leave that place. And there was Jesus standing. But she did not know it was him because he had more or less gone into a glorified state. And then Jesus said unto her, Woman, now these are the words of Jesus, Woman, why weepest thou, and whom thou seekest? And she supposed that this was the gardener. And this is what she said, Sir, if thou had borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I would take him away. Here is Jesus. Jesus decided. Mary, come on. Mary, come on. Could you imagine the emotions in that woman's heart? She thought that Jesus is dead. She thought that he's gone. She thought they have stolen his body. Now she sees him and she doesn't recognize him. And then she hears the word Mary. Come on. How many of you like to be called by Jesus? Hear what I'm telling you. She says Mary and Jesus turns around and says Rabboni. Come on somebody understand me. And he says Mary you don't have to touch me. I am alive. Come on. I have conquered hell, death and the grave. You you got to send back the flowers and send back the undertaker and send back the embalmers and send back the funeral possession. I am alive. I have conquered it all. I walk around now, Mary. Don't touch me yet, but I got something to give you. And he blew upon her. The Holy Spirit fell on her and the journey of the empowerment of the end time church began. The Holy Ghost has taken over now. What does his resurrection represent to us? Supernatural capacities, a haze of brilliance, divine enablement. Maybe you were trying to do something before and you just didn't get it done. I just want to challenge you now. The tomb is empty. Come on, the tomb is empty. Defeat has been replaced by victory. Death has been swallowed up. His journey was not in vain. 
Hadn't it been for the resurrection? Could I say something? You can do all things through Christ now. That woman said to me, Dr. Carmody, I have lost my two breasts to cancer and they took out my womb and my uterus and whatever else. She says, do you think I can have a baby? Come on. I said, sister, if you know the resurrection power, that's going to hit the church very soon. And an understanding of the authority that we have got by virtue of this resurrection. Mary, send back the flowers. There, there ain't going to be no funeral. Send back the undertaker and the grave diggers. Send back the hearse. Send back Simpson and Batu. There's going to be no funeral for this dude. Come on. I am alive. You could come back from every dead, lifeless, broken relationship. God is going to restore your finances. He is alive. God is going to heal your bodies. He is alive. God is going to bless your marriage. He is alive. God is going to send your children home on their knees because He is alive. You might have brought them up in church and they went into the world like the prodigal. Could I tell you something? Because He is alive. You're going to come to church one day and see them at the altars with their hands lifted up and they are speaking in tongues because He is alive. My question to you again this morning. If the resurrection is the consolidation, the aggregate, the calcification, the collecting of everything through eternity and the birthing of power in the church. Should we be more resurrection oriented than cross centered? Challenge you this morning. Like Martin Luther King. How did you enjoy all them guys wanted to kill you all your life, man? He says, because I lived in view of eternity. I look towards the resurrected life. When Stephen was being stoned, how did he survive? He looked towards the resurrected life, my dear friends. Hear what I'm saying? Hear what I'm saying to you this evening? I don't want you to leave this place without asking that resurrected anointing, that resurrection anointing to replace your human understanding. You don't have to fix your problems. The Bible says, cast your cares upon me. You don't have to carry that burden. How many of you carry burdens? Come on, lift your hands. It's natural. Come on, I want you to do this. Hey, watch me. Get it off your mind. Get it off of your mind. You don't have to carry that burden. Come on, put it. Give it to God. He says, cast your cares upon me. The doctor don't have to tell you about your condition of heart, Steve. Let him carry the burden. I want to change a position this morning that you may hold in your life. You don't have to work out God's problems. The problem that you are having is God's problem. You don't have to fix up God's business. You don't have to fix up his business. God is great all by himself. Because the tomb is empty this morning. There is no prison door that could hold you. Let's lift your hands to God this morning, please. Slip your hands to God, please. And I'm challenging you, my dear friends. You know, I'm a Trinidadian like you. I left Trinidad in 1974. But I come back occasionally, do some ministry, etc., etc. Some folks like me, some don't. I really trouble the ecumenical people. And I am happy doing it. Just lift your hands to God. You don't have to carry. 
that condition, that health and that medical condition, he is the great physician. You don't have to trust in your banker. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Come on, friends. Never seen my righteous forsaken, nor my seed begging bread. You ain't have to beg for bread. Come on, somebody say amen. When God is your father and he owns it all. If you ask him for a bread, would he give you a serpent? No, my dear friends. But I just want that to be a recalibration of our mentalities this morning. That we are going to be a resurrection people from this day onwards. Because I believe that the Lord's left me in Trinidad, brother, to talk this kind of way. Get away from the old mama and get into the new. This is where God is calling us. Slip your hands to God, please. Thank you for joining us today. Please like and share this video. If you need prayer or counseling, feel free to call us at 680-7111 or WhatsApp us at 754-4270. Someone is ready and waiting to pray and speak with you. If you desire to make a financial contribution, you can make a direct deposit to our Scotiabank checking account Bibleway Temple, account number 1200176, transit number 90035. On behalf of the leadership of this ministry, Apostle Celestin and Mother Europol, we say thank you and we look forward to having you fellowship with us another Sunday.